Hello and welcome to the Health Equity Lecture Series presented by the FDA Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. This month, as part of our observance of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we are presenting a conversation about health equity and community-based research with Dr. Frankie Wong of Florida State University. I'm Rear Admiral Richard A. Arojo, the Associate Commissioner for Minority Health and Director of FDA's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, where we have a dedicated mission to protect and promote the health of diverse populations through research and communication of science that addresses health disparities. And I'm glad to welcome Dr. Wong, who is the McKenzie Endowed Professor of Health Equity Research and founding director of the Center of Population Science for Health Equity at Florida State University. Dr. Wong is an expert in community-based research among racial, ethnic, and underserved populations. He is also a behavioral and social sciences researcher who conducts NIH-funded research addressing the sexual health and substance use and abuse, as well as other health disparities among Asian American and Pacific Islanders in the United States. Dr. Wong's NIH-funded research focuses on the social epidemiology of alcohol, tobacco and other drugs, HIV, and other non-HIV sexually transmitted infections among populations in the United States, South Africa, China, Tajikistan, Vietnam, and Russia. Welcome, Dr. Wong, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Admiral. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Dr. Wong, your career path is an interesting one and includes a variety of work you've done across disciplines. Can you tell us more about your career trajectory and personal journey? Yeah, I think the two people that uh, comes to mind is my mother, my late mother, and my late undergraduate advisor. My mom always have the saying that try everything one. You don't like it, you don't have to do it again. And she was an extremely adventurous person. Um, she passed away when she was 93, but she didn't have me when she was 34. So if you think about her generation of Asian women, it's phenomenal, right? Because she had a career, she worked, what have you. She met my dad uh, in a dancing hall. So she's very adventurous. And she let me give me free reign in terms of what I want to do. I can tell you an example about how she cultivated my, my uh, intellectual interest and uh, adventurism. I was a teen, I was, I, I was a good student. I got good grades, but I was also very rebellious. So there was, I think I was 13 or 14. And then one day I went out to hang out with friends. I told her that I was gonna go out and she said, no problem. I didn't show back up in the house two o'clock in the morning. She locked the door. So that was her way of telling me that, okay, you have your responsibility as an individual. You can make your decision. So I learned my lesson that, okay, so like if I promise something, I need to deliver. So I think that taught me a great lesson. My undergraduate advisor, John Hunterby uh, in Canada, uh, was the one that opened up my mind in terms of like, uh, exploring psychology and different things. And he's originally from Scotland. But when I look at John's life, he married a Texan. So the, the, the combination is so interesting. And both Margaret and John has been a wonderful mentor, almost like second parents. So they are the one that encouraged me like to, uh, to go. So I think these personal touch really have an influence in terms of like what I end up doing because I thought about medicine and being an Asian man, and of course, like all Asian men, the stereotype, like you're going to go into medicine. And I said to myself, well, I don't like blood, that kind of ruled me out. And so what am I good at? I'm very analytic, I'm very like quantitative. So I end up like follow John's footstep and get a degree in psychology. You know, I, I think that personal approach is so important. You talked about that intersection from your family, your mother, and then your professional mentors. And, you know, I want to expand on that a little bit more. How has um, your interdisciplinary approach inspired your work and how does it influence the ways you hope to serve vulnerable and underserved communities? Uh, I was very fortunate when I started graduate school, uh, my background is in psychology. And normally, like being a psychology student, you've been placed in the psychology department for your internship, for your research training, what have you. I 
was not assigned in the psychology department. I was assigned to a public policy department. So very early on, I learned about the importance of like public policy. So I work with pretty much like political scientists from the get go. So I was exposed to a different discipline. Then I said, like, oh, actually there's more to life than psychology. There are other things that different way of looking issue. So I learned how to do polling uh, and I work with sociologists. I think that original uh, very early on exposure kind of opened up my mind that, yeah, psychology is good, but there is more to love than psychology. That's why I'm interested in other disciplines. So. And Dr. Wong, how would you advise people who are just starting out in their careers to seek out interdisciplinary research or work? As my mom said, try everything once. You don't like it, you don't have to do it again. But it's important that it's a journey. Okay, so now I have a PhD. I'm fairly well established. Uh, but you never use, I don't stop learning. I learn every single day. Uh, I can give you another example, like learn from anyone, whether that person has a degree or no degree. One of my closest friends, he never uh, gone to university. But he's probably the most brilliant researcher I have ever like met. And on top of that, he's a tomorrow. So Richard from Guam. So I learned a whole lot about what's it like to be a tomorrow living in the mainland versus like I actually know all his family. So I actually been to Guam, visit his fam a family, what have you. So every day I learn something. So don't fixate on a degree, don't fixate on like a, a technique. Relax, learn, learn from other people. And I think that is so important. You know, you are you have to continue to learn along your journey. And as, you know, with the work that you've done, I want to shift now to talk a little bit more specifically about your research. Um, as we continue to observe Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, can you share some of your most recent work with those communities to address health disparities? My current work in the API community are mostly focusing on HIV. He's a HIV positive individual living HIV as a chronic disease. So in addition to HIV, they also have other health issues as part of aging, right? such as hypertension, diabetes. So I have a cohort study of Asian Pacific Islander, including Native Hawaiian and Hawaii, and also compared to African-American gay and bisexual men living with HIV in Philadelphia. You think about it collectively, these two group of individuals are racial ethnic minority. In addition, they are also sexual minority. So above and beyond HIV, what are some of the macrosocial determinants such as racism, sexism, ageism affect their condition, meaning in this case living HIV and hypertension? And it turns out that the individual living in Philadelphia, these are most African American, they report much higher level racial discrimination than the Asian and Pacific Islander in Hawaii. It's not to say that AAPI in Hawaii don't experience, but then Hawaii is a very, very different environment. So I was a faculty at Hawaii briefly, and I remember my good friend was saying to me, you being Asian actually carry no way in Hawaii. I said, what do you mean? And she said that here is either you're local or not local. You're Hawaiian born or you're not Hawaiian born. But nonetheless, many of my API participants still report high level of racism, had nothing to do with the HIV condition. So I think it's important to keep in mind that when you are living with a chronic disease, on top of that, you also have to deal with all the sexual thing. It's really challenging. Yeah, and, and Dr. Wong, I, I know as you just described that a lot of your work has centered on HIV and the stigma um, that many of these communities experience. Can you talk a little bit now about where you think you, we've seen progress and, and what challenges remain? Well, I came from that generation. My generation was the one that got decimated by the HIV epidemic. So I remember the old days, like when there were no treatment, okay? Uh, for better or worse, I do think that we have made some tremendous progress uh, with like PEFA by former President Bush um, and the Global Fund. 
and the fact that these days you flick on the TV, there is commercial about HIV drugs. I remember days we cannot talk about condoms on TV. We cannot talk about treatment on TV. We cannot talk about openly about sex on TV. We still have a long way to go, but I do think we have made progress that some of this issue become more mainstream. I mean, every day, every night when I flick on TV, there is a commercial about HIV drugs, HIV treatment drug. I remember in remember the old day, like you have to take so many regimen, but these days you take one pill and that's it. And I do think we have made progress, but we still have a long way to go be able to talk openly about sexuality and some of these other issues. Yeah, I think that is, that is so true. And of course, next month, June, is Pride Month. And I know you've done a lot of your work around health equity that involves LGBTQI plus populations. And I wondered if you could discuss some of the unique challenges face, facing LGBTQI communities as we continue the work to address health disparities among all underserved populations. Well, we are living in an interesting time. I mean, if you follow all the national uh, conversation, there is a lot of like uh, anti-LGBT movement, uh, anti-trans movement, um, but we cannot give up. We have to keep, keep on pushing the envelope. And also it's important to remind ourselves that LGBT is not a monolithic uh, like community, okay? For someone like myself, you meet me the first time, you probably don't know I'm gay, right? You probably think about I'm just like another Asian guy down the road. Okay? So it's important to actually try to know the person. The person can come from different background. And also I'm a naturalized citizen. So I'm also an immigrant. So I'm not American born. So I also bring in one part of it, but then I don't mean to use myself as example. Like, But if you think about the, the multiple identity an individual can occupy, I'm foreign born, but I grew up pretty much in British Hong Kong, colonial Hong Kong. So for all intents and purposes, my upbringing is very British, but I also graduated in Canada. So uh, like did my undergraduate, what have you. So the LGBT community these days does have its own challenge because of the political and social climate right now, but we cannot give up. We must push the envelope. We, if you, we don't continue to bring the conversation to the table, then we're just going backward. We, I am not interested in going backward. I'm interested in moving forward. And that's why it's so important for us to work directly with communities. And you've acknowledged the importance of working with communities. Why is it working with community partners critical to advancing health equity? Uh, I can give you one example. Like in the two, mid 2000, I decide I want to do a particular NIH study involving testing among Asian and Pacific Islander MSM, men having sex with men. At that time, I already have the relationship with the community, but this is a very big study. This is a national study involving seven cities, like Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, New York, Boston. And it's because I know the community partner. I just call up my colleagues and friends. I said, listen, we need to do something. This is what I have in mind. Are you on board? Are you willing to support me? It's not that I'm the brilliant, the most brilliant scientist, but they trust me because I have that relationship with them. So everybody came on board for that study. And that study was a little bit challenging, but ultimately three of the community partners that I worked with, two of them eventually able to use this lesson learned. They are currently... Uh, FQHC clinic now. So they're able to build capacity and then grow. And the other one is also doing some wonderful work. So working with community is about trust. It is people need to know that you're not doing helicopter research. You're here to really work with them that down, at the end of the day, someone should benefit from your research. Not because like I can publish another paper and shelve it on the shelf and no one wants to read it. Yeah, I think that's so important and really highlighting that trust and, and the importance of building that trust. And based on your experience, is there any advice that you have for individuals or communities hoping to drive greater diversity and inclusion in clinical research? 
Um, diversity is our strength. Coming from different, having different perspective, given what, uh, diff- we we may end up coming with different solution uh, to address the problem and it, or more efficient, more effective. What I am going to say is that I want my generation step up the play to mentor the next generation. So what if tomorrow I decide not to do what I'm doing? Someone have to be able to carry the torch. But I am concerned about the younger generation don't have the history of what we've gone through. History, if you don't learn from history, you can make the same mistake again. So I am making a plea to my peers of my generation, step up the play, do something, or do more. They're doing something, but I want them to do more. Yeah, mentoring is so very important, especially as we think about those ways that we can advance diversity and inclusion as well as um, advanced diversity in clinical research. And I'd like to close by asking you about any other steps that researchers can take to bring health equity to the forefront of public health or any other discipline. I think it's important to make sure that the research finding uh, are digestible and being able to disseminate uh, to the community. Um, my co-director, uh, who is also my uh, co-founder of the center. She's originally from Panama. She currently is uh, finishing up her 2023 Presidential Leader Scholarship. It is because of her connection. Uh, I got to know different people from her cohort. And one of her colleagues was so wonderful. They said that I have this tech company. I'm more than happy to help you guys to disseminate things. So Think beyond just your own discipline. Think about what can other people that share your vision that can work together with you to disseminate the the information back to the community. I think if the community can hear you, they may not understand everything. I think we move the needle a little bit. And with that, I want to thank you again, Dr. Wong, for joining us today, for informing us about the important work you're doing, and for a great conversation. Before we close, I want to encourage our viewers to visit the FDA Office of Minority Health and Health Equity website at fda.gov forward slash health equity to learn more about our initiatives and resources. Thank you for tuning in to the discussion and happy AANHPI Heritage Month. Thank you.